Live from New York, it's the first plenary session of the Frontiers in Optics and Laser Science Conference. Please welcome FIO General Co-Chairs Tehran Erdogan and T.C. Poon. Hello and welcome. Tehran and I, along with Laser Science General Co-Chairs Randy Patels and David Rees welcome you to the conference and our first plenary session. For the past two years, Frontiers in Optics was presented by necessity as an all virtual meeting. Today, as I look out and see the audience congregated uh, in this theater, I'm very really happy to say it is great to be back in, to an in-person conference. It has been too long. However, we understand not everyone is free to travel yet, so we are also very really pleased to know that so many colleagues are joining us online from all over the world. This week, whether you are here in Rochester, New York, or participating from your home or office, we celebrate together the science and innovations from our community. From optical interactions to photonic integrated devices, and from applications that take a microscopic look at the human body to a macro bird's eye view of the universe, Frontiers in Optics reminds us scientists and engineers or that uh, we are active participants in the evolution of discovery. A conference of this scale requires the dedication of many individuals. More than 100 committee members gave so much of their time to construct this week's technical program. They reviewed and sessioned almost 1,000 contributed papers, posters, and post-deadline papers they selected invited speakers, and they developed the technical content of two theme programs on machine learning and virtual reality. On behalf of the general chairs, thank you to our technical committee members for the dedication. Please join me in recognizing the efforts. Thank you. Uh TC and I would also like to acknowledge the support of our corporate sponsors and exhibitors whose financial assistance helps to make Frontiers in Optics possible. And uh, finally, we'd, we'd like to thank the two societies who co-sponsor the conference, the American Physical Society, the Division of Laser Science, and of course, Optica. Later this evening, uh, we hope that you join us for the conference reception, which is going to be held in the Lilac Ballroom starting at 6.30 p.m. The reception's theme tonight recognizes the Optica Foundation, which is celebrating its 20th anniversary. That means 20 years of creating and offering more than 30 scholarships, grants, prizes, and professional development programs each year to benefit students and early career professionals. In other words, the next generation of innovators and leaders in optics and photonics. Now, this morning, before our plenary talk, which will take place in just a few minutes, the Optica Foundation would like to announce the winners of a unique challenge competition. So to announce the winners of the 20th anniversary challenge, uh, please welcome Foundation Board Director and 2020 Optica President, Steve Fantone. Thank you, TC and Turan. As Turan mentioned, the Optica Foundation is celebrating its 20th anniversary this year. To mark the occasion, the Foundation is awarding 1 million US dollars in prizes to winner of its 20th and anniversary challenge. Appli applicants were challenged to propose a way in which they could use optics and photonics to solve a real-world challenge in the categories of environment, 
health, and information. It is my pleasure to announce our 10 official winners. At your seats, you can see their names and proposed titles. For those online, these are posted at the Optica.org Foundation Challenge. The winners are Ashim Dakal, Dismas Chog, Guangwei Hu, Chao Rang Wang, Xing Chen Ji, Mark Lawrence, Michaela Picardi, Wanvisa Talataisong, Florian Willemitzer, and Menjie Yu. And I believe one of these exceptional individuals is here today. Florian, if you could please stand. Over the next year, we will follow these individuals on their journeys and hope that you will stay tuned to our updates throughout the year. In addition to awarding these 10 prizes, the Foundation is proud to announce that the Theodore W. Honch Prize in Quantum Optics has been established in partnership with Menlo Systems, Thor Labs, and Hamamatsu Photonics. The new prize, created in honor of Nobel laureate Ted Honch, is an opportunity for early career researchers in quantum to be recognized. And finally, I encourage you to join me in supporting the next generation of optics and photonics and students and early career professionals, like those recognized through the challenge by donating $20 or more to the Optica Foundation in celebration of 20 years. There is also a match being funded by my wife and I of $10,000 for those of you that give a donation uh, in the next day or so. So please, this is a chance for you, particularly as students, to start that spirit of philanthropy towards this organization. I thank you very much. Congratulations again to the winners of the 2020 Optica Challenge. So now we're gonna begin the technical content of our session with our 2020 FIO plenary speaker, Scott Acton. Just a few words of introduction. It started with a child's game of dominoes. Scott and his uncle stack them up and knock them down. His uncle begins to ask Scott questions. What might happen if we push the dominoes closer together? Would they fall faster or slower? What if we spread them farther apart? After hypothesizing, his uncle says three words that are life-changing to the young boy. That's physics, Scott. Fast forward to today, and Scott is the lead wavefront sensing and control scientist for the James Webb Space Telescope and a scientist at Ball Aerospace and Technologies in Colorado. Scott and his colleagues were responsible for the systems that align the 18 separate segments of the Webb's primary mirror with its smaller secondary mirror and the scientific instruments. After more than 20 years of his career working on this project, it is now an operating telescope. It's no longer about making it work, but rather keeping it working and using it for science. Going home from work on the day that the first images came down from the telescope, Scott wrote these words. We are surrounded by a symphony of creation. There are galaxies everywhere. Ladies and gentlemen, would you please join me in giving a warm welcome to Scott Acton. Everybody, thank you. Can you hear me? OK, good. Yes, thank you so much. It's really, really fun to be here. Uh, what an honor. Uh, wow. So we got lots to talk about and very little time to do it. So I'm just going to get with it here. Let's see. So here's the first uh, picture. I call this Farewell Web. And this was the last picture of the spacecraft that was taken as it was moving away from Earth. It was completely accidental. Uh, it was just a, a, a camera, an engineering camera on the, the top of the second stage. And it snapped this picture. There it is, the beautiful Arabian Peninsula in the background there. What a great way to say farewell to a, uh, something that's been your, your companion, your friend for two decades. I'm going to show you a lot of pictures today. You know, you've seen these too, but my pictures are not going to look like this. They're going to look 
kind of more like this. <laughs> because it has to look like this before you can get it to look like this, right? So that's what I'm going to do today is tell you the story of how my team and I uh, took you know, this telescope that was kind of randomly deployed in space and move all the optics and everything such that it ends up taking uh, a diffraction limited image across the entire science field. But I'm also going to tell you another story kind of snuck in on the side there. I'm going to tell you uh, just for fun about how I used the fact that this telescope was delayed for so many years to fulfill or to attempt to fulfill a lifelong dream and that is to ride my bicycle around the world. All right, here's the telescope. It's not a picture, but obviously you can't take a picture of the telescope being out in space and all that, an artist's conception. And then this is, of course, the picture that I, I show. I give this as a, as a definition of narcissism. <laughs> if anybody asks you what narcissism means, just tell them this picture, taking a picture of yourself in a $10 billion optic. Here it is uh, compared to the Hubble telescope. You've probably seen many of these things. Um, we number all the mirror segments. So we get to know them. They're almost like, like our children. They all have their individual little characteristics, everything. And here, just to give you a si uh, an idea of the scale of the telescope, is, is a model that was uh, set up out front of, this is actually a museum. It's an old uh, Catholic church in Dublin, Ireland, uh, converted to a museum. And you can see this thing's enormous, okay? It's enormous. That sun shield there is the size of a tennis court. Uh, it, it just, it's mind-boggling how big this is, which means it can't fit into any kind of a launch vehicle. Now, the mirrors themselves are optics on one side, but they're mechanical devices on the other side. We have seven actuators for each mirror segment, and the secondary has six. So the six actuators make a hexapod. We can control it in six degrees of freedom. And the seventh actuator is used to adjust the radius of curvature of that mirror, um, which can change its, basically uh, its focal length. The science instruments shown here are, there's actually uh, like nine different science modes on the telescope. And that's part of the reason you know, it was such a big project is because it does a lot more than just than any other spacecraft would do. We have a spectrograph. And there's these two near-infrared cameras, the near cams. These are, are, are built by the University of Arizona. Um, there's the mid-infrared imager, MIRI. Then there's the near-infrared imager and slitless spectrograph, which is a Canadian instrument. And then there is a, a, the fine guidance sensors, uh, which we use to stabilize the pointing of the telescope. They're also built by the Canadian team. Now, the near-infrared camera is what we primarily use to align the telescope. And in fact, mostly what we use is this single detector right here. But this, these are big. Each one of these detectors, of which there are eight, are 2048 by 2048 infrared pixels, which is pretty big when, it, when you're talking about an infrared detector. All right, now let's sidestep just a moment to the, the bike ride. So I found myself in a very unique opportunity. There was a period of time in the project where I didn't really matter very much because our work is mostly done. And my children were all out of the house, in college at least, and even though I was 55 years old, my body hadn't figured it out yet. And so I decided to take a year of my life and set it aside, and I formed something called the James Webb Space Telescope World Bicycle Tour. The goal, bicycle around the world-ish, you know, not exactly all the world, but a part of it, and stop and give lectures about this telescope once or twice a week to various communities and schools and colleges and all that. It was pretty neat. I got a logo set up. Uh, I got... Um, a website is still there, actually. You want to read about the ride. I got special bike jerseys made and everything. I got people to go with me on the ride. And I also got this little pain right here in my chest every time I would get on the bicycle and head out for the day. This was in, in like August of, of 2015. I was bicycling 200 miles a week, okay, which is about as much as you can do and still have a full-time job. And I would feel a little pain right here whenever I get on my bike. So, but I knew it couldn't be my heart. Everybody told me it couldn't be my heart. But one doctor led to another, one test led to another, and come to find out the arteries in my heart were clogged beyond anybody's wildest imagination. I was dazed from death and I didn't know it. I, my daughter was getting married in three days. I asked the surgeon if we could wait till after the wedding and he says, yeah, that way all your family will be in town for the funeral. No, no, we can't wait. So that was it. Uh, I had the surgery. Guys, we were, running, we were short on time today, but I want you to know, uh, I got to take a minute and say this. In a group of people this large, there's going to be a handful of you that are going to have to have this surgery. I want you to know that that surgery is optional. You don't have to do it. You guys are all intelligent. The science behind your blood chemistry and your risk for heart disease is 100%. 
Get yourself tested, make changes in your life today so that you don't have to do this. It was absolutely horrible. In any case, I delayed the ride a little bit. I figured I would go ahead and do it. But um, let's step back over to the wavefront sensing part of this. Now this is what our wavefront room looked like. We had various people at any given time. You might have 10 or 15 people in this room here. And here are a couple of my team sitting there analyzing some dispersed fridge sensing data. Now I gotta talk a little bit, I'm not gonna go into much theory in this talk, but I do have to mention this thing called phase retrieval. It's, it's magic. I, I have no idea why it's, the thing should work out this way, but this enables us to phase the telescope. Imagine this, if you had a function that's a complex function, and you can make some very simple assumptions about that function, mainly that it's spatially bounded and that it's analytic. If that's the case, if you know the real part, you can find the imaginary part, and if you know the imaginary part, you can find the real part. So basically, you only need to know that. Now, in two dimensions, it's even less restrictive. But here's the point. If I can know the amplitude of a complex function with some simple assumptions about that amplitude, I can then find the phase, in theory at least. Okay, you see, just because you know a solution exists doesn't automatically give you that solution. Okay, you still gotta figure out how to find it. But anyway, that's, this makes it possible to, to find out what's wrong with the telescope to phase it. And we use phase retrieval all throughout this process. Now sometimes we move the secondary mirror to defocus the telescope, and other times we use these lenses that are in the near cam instruments, and they take the telescope out of focus without having to move anything. And as long as I got this plot showing the commissioning process here, we do a lot of work with centroids, just simply measuring the centroid of a spot from a, from a mirror segment. And then we also do some dispersed fringe sensing. This enables us to tell the piston, the, the edge discontinuity from one segment to the next. All right. So as you know, this telescope deployed and there's some just really, really impressive animations that show what a complicated process this was, but this chart sums it up pretty well. And then we started with the actual deployment of the mirror segments. So we were gonna move those actuators to take the mirrors out of their stowed positions into their final positions. This was done very, very conservatively, a step at a time, then a rotation at a time, very, very, very careful. And somebody mentioned that this process was, the mirrors were moving slower than grass grows. And so Jane Rigby, the project scientist, uh, made us a chia web and watered in. We, sure enough, these seeds grew considerably faster than we were moving our mirror segments at the time. But we got them all deployed. And then back over to the bike ride. So on April 1st, I took off. April 1st, 2016, I took off out of, Fort, out of Denver, uh, Boulder, Colorado, heading north. And there I am on my bike. And we ran into you know, some things. It, it, you know, it's up through Wyoming and everything, through Colorado, Wyoming. Uh, it was... Uh, a very, very terrible, terrible winds, terrible freezing headwinds, um, terrible fifth graders, <laughs> terrible, one of the more intimidating audiences I think I've ever talked to, but I gave a lot of talks as I went, you know, kept going up through Thermopolis, Wyoming, just beautiful scenery. Ah, I gave a talk in Grable, Wyoming, why not make a cake? There I am going into Montana, this is Bozeman Pass, it just about did me in. Trucks going past 70 miles an hour in the freezing snow. And then, then finally things cleared up a little bit, a little more peaceful. And then we, back to the telescope now, we took the first light. So everything is deployed, but we have no idea where all these mirrors are pointed. So on February 2nd, in the middle of the night, we pointed the telescope at the large Magellanic cloud and just took some images on the near cam detectors. And here is... What I saw, I took this with my, my cell phone. This was the first image that came down off of the telescope, and as you can see, nothing is phased up and everything. Everybody was just so happy because the science system was working. There wasn't a piece of mylar in front of the entrance aperture or something like that. And, but I'm looking at this going, oh my gosh, what did we do to the telescope? <laughs> because you see those little cigar-shaped looking things? That shouldn't be there. And, uh, well, it turns out it was just a perfect storm. There was nothing wrong. But it wasn't, it wasn't until Super Bowl Saturday that we realized that we hadn't done something really bad to at least a couple of those mirror segments. So then we pointed this telescope at a bright, isolated star and executed a raster pattern, just taking images, and then stitched them all together to make a mosaic. Now, ideally, we ought to be seeing 18 spots here, right? And that's exactly what we found. We were expecting the pointing to be way off, in fact, it was really good, it was like five arc minutes, and we were expecting the spots to be spread out a lot more, but we got, you know, not lucky, it was just good engineering. They were only spread out also by about five arc minutes or so. Hundreds of exposures, and, and there they are, 
let's see if I'll skip to the thing. Here is the mosaic after stitching everything together. Um, you, if you count very carefully, you'll see 18 spots. And eventually we would figure out which segment was which. And these, where I circled them, are, correspond to the wings. And as you can imagine, those are deployed mechanisms. You would expect them to move together. And by and large, they mostly do. All right? So then that crosshair in the middle, the goal is to then tilt all these segments so that they come together to form a tight little array in this detector. But we'll get to that in a second. Um, I mentioned that, uh, that I should point out that this project was a collaboration between NASA, the European Space Agency, and the Canadian Space Agency. Those three people, the groups collaborated for this. So I went to Canada, crossed into Alberta. And uh, this is when I gave up on using Google, Google Maps for, for bike riding. British Columbia was just so beautiful. All this stuff is just, just incredible. I, I've never seen anything, the wildlife all over the place. Uh, if you ever get a chance to head up that way, up into the Yukon and Alaska, just imagine you're taking a ride in the mountains with your family on a Sunday afternoon, except that mountain scenery continues for two and a half thousand miles. That is what this is like. It seems to never ends. It just goes onward and onward and river and river and lake after lake. Unbelievable beauty. But such a rugged country though. There's a highway there, but you go 50 feet either direction off the road and there's nothing, just nothing. Every creek or river we passed, I passed, uh, had, um, fish in it. You could just see it all over there. It, it was just all kinds of things. It's so much wild animals and, and scenery and stuff. Just beautiful. But such an unforgiving place. If you make any mistake and it could kill you in a heartbeat. But just beautiful. Into the Yukon Territory. Uh, this was Watson Lake, Utah. You know, but I just, uh, it's such a peaceful place to be as well, you know. But um, I, I hope I can go back sometime. There it is. Uh, there's the head of the Canadian Astronomical Society. I liked everything except the bugs. I could have done without the bugs, but it was just a, a beautiful, beautiful place experience. And I came to a fork in the road, and I took it. Found myself in Alaska, continued up to Alaska, and then got all the way to Fairbanks. So then the first thing we did is we were decided to focus the telescope. And looking at that initial mosaic, there was obviously a focus bias. So what we do is we move the secondary, and essentially just pick the image that has the best focus and set the secondary to that position. Now granted, it's done with phase retrieval, and we also hope to be able to determine which segment was which based on the way those spots moved as we moved the secondary mirror. But the pointing of the telescope was not very good initially and it wandered all over the place, so we had to do this a different way. This is running phase retrieval on one of those groups of images, and you notice that the algorithm is placing this vertical line into the phase map into the, into the retrieved amplitude. That's the secondary mirror support structure. So I then knew that that segment had to be segment number 12 and could register these images to make it move like it was predicted to move. And then lo and behold, everything comes into position and I could tell which segment is which on all of those. Then we went on to uh, identify the rest of the segments. And now what we want to do is we need to tilt these things so that they all come together and we'll point the telescope so that that detector is seeing that part of the sky. And here's what we ended up with. I remember one of my colleagues pointed out, this is the moment he knew we would get the telescope phased. Because getting all those things found is, is it's, it's, not, it's not rocket science, but it's uh, a lot of really challenging bookkeeping and it's just, it's usually where you make a mistake. And so we moved them all into this nice little array pattern. We colored it blue and released it and it went viral. Everybody thought this was really, really neat. Of course, a lot of really smart people said, hey, how come those two segments on the lower left and the lower right are so bad? Well, that's the same thing I was thinking. So then uh, after on the bike ride, after the, uh, North America, I went on to Europe. I got stuck in Gibraltar for a week because Royal Air Maroc would not give me my bicycle. Uh, eventually, uh, eventually they sent it to England and, and, and British Airways were able to get it to me. Um, but in any way, case, I started going through Spain uh, Spain is a, was a really, really hard place to bicycle because they don't allow bikes on the roads that, that cars typically are on. And uh, it was really hard, but France was a lot better. What a beautiful place, a beautiful country. I'd never been to France prior to this and some of the friendliest people I've ever encountered. You know, there's a stereotype, it's not true. Uh, what, just wonderful people in France. Even the Parisians were nice to me. 
Um, just beautiful uh, architecture and scenery. And then one day I walked to the little store and noticed they wouldn't take my euros anymore because I was in Switzerland. <laughs> and I just got into Switzerland and didn't know it. An international bicycle path uh, down here on the, uh, on the, uh, on the left side is, uh, is actually the Eurovelo 6, the international bike path, which after this little goat trail, they have stairs. I don't know, why don't I have stairs on a bike path? So anyway, uh, I took the bike up the stairs. I ended up to the Geneva Observatory. This place has been there longer than the United States has been a country. And I showed up on my bike. It was really neat. Uh, uh, Claude Nicolier, an astronaut uh, in the Hubble era, came to see my talk, uh, met the director. It was pretty cool. And then on to Germany. This is the start of the Danube River, and I followed the Danube River for, for quite a ways. Um, just uh, again, just more beautiful, beautiful scenery, just a wonderful uh, you know, landscape and everything. Into Austria, um, I ended up in Vienna. Uh, this is some interesting graffiti along the Danube. And I stopped over at the Institute for Quantum Optics and Quantum Information. Uh, uh, Anton Zeilinger hosted me. Uh, you know, he won the Nobel Prize just a couple weeks ago. <laughs> Pretty cool, huh? And then they ended up in uh, Slovakia. I didn't even know I was going through Slovakia, but there I was, and uh, somebody arranged a talk at the university there, and that was, that was pretty neat. Um, and then on into, into Budapest, into Hungary, just beautiful architecture. And now we're back to com commissioning the telescope. So what we did is we moved the secondary mirror in focus and then ran phase retrieval on the images we took, for, but each individual segment at a time. And here's what we ended up with on uh, the upper left-hand corner is the phase. And you see there is some large uh, focus errors on two of those segments. But the, um, in the lower one, you see that those segments have a little donut shape in them. Well, that is because the radius of curvature actuators on those segments were somehow put to the wrong values. It's somewhat of a mystery. Uh, they were way off. And so rather than correcting the power that we observed in the segments by pistoning those segments, uh, which was our plan, we went ahead and adjusted it with the radius of curvature actuator. I suspect all the radius of curvature values were off somehow, um, but uh, it was more pronounced on those two. And we also noticed that we had to move the secondary mirror by a millimeter in each axis. It was the combination of those effects that created such a pronounced astigmatism and defocus term on those segments. And once we uh, corrected those errors, um, we ended up having you know, no wavefront error as well. After a couple iterations, we got the wavefront error down to 58 nanometers RMS, that's in the surface of the mirror. And of course, that doesn't count the large piston errors that are still between the segments. Here's the images before and after, and you can see it goes from very, very aberrated to very, very not aberrated. Then what we have to do is we need to move all these segments into the center so that we can make a couple of different measurements, mainly using dispersed fringe sensing techniques to measure the piston between the segments. And I'll let this animation play out. It's a rather complicated thing because we have to know exactly where the spot is and we can't waste the, the fine range of the actuators. So anyway, I want to say every time you see an image change in this, think about it. People on the ground, a team had to decide that they wanted to move that. They had to generate the commands that the telescope could understand. They had to send them through the deep space network and all the way up into space. It takes the images, it moves the mirror segments, takes the images and downloads those images through the deep space network, through the process, the pipeline of the, at the Institute and the Mission Operations Center. And then it appears in our computer and it gets analyzed. So that's why this takes months to do and not hours. It's a, it, it, there's really quite a process that but in any case, we got all the mirrors stacked, and they're at a single point. Now, they're not phased in piston with respect to each other, but they're on top of each other. So we took a selfie. Now, this we called it a pupil image, but showed it to the administrator of NASA, and he says, oh, you mean it's a selfie? And we go, yeah, it's a selfie. Yeah. You know, he's, he's a very good communicator, and he very quickly uh, come up with a way of describing this so people would understand. So that's a pupil image. And we use that in phase retrieval, so we have the amplitude constraints. But we took a picture of the Large Magellanic Cloud again, and this went on the lock screen of my, my iPhone. But it's not phased, but still it looks pretty cool, right? Let's see, what do we got? So then we use this dispersed fringe sensing technique uh, to measure piston differences between pairs of segments. And because we have two near cam channels, we can actually get 30 different combinations of, of measurements. And here, here are some of the images that come down. And because some of these piston errors were really large, 
uh, we were running out of dynamic range in this technique, but fortunately we could shift to slightly longer wavelengths and we can see this effect. I wish I could go into this in more detail, but these create these little barber pole patterns and that tells you what the piston difference is between, within a pair of segments. Then you use the linear algebra to, uh, to solve this system of equations and you know what the piston corrections need to be. All right. So here we are between plus and minus a quarter, quarter millimeter were what we applied. Those are pretty big uh, piston corrections. And then we tilted the segment out for the next step. So I went back to the United States after Europe and put my bicycle in exactly the same spot that I left in when I went north and then headed south out of town. And this was fun. This is what I think of America. Just these beautiful little sunsets and small towns and stuff. I just, I just love this kind of stuff. It was a, a really easy ride. Um, I actually got out of shape on this ride because there's no hills, there really weren't any wind, and a lot of really, really fattening food. And uh, bed bugs in your hotel room, no problem on a bike. You just pitch your tent, and then you're safe from them. Just beautiful. And there's my good friend Sam Cook. He's a professional opera singer. I met up with him. We rode a little bit. Uh, fire ants in Texas, discovered those. That's the, uh, I camped in the campground. That's the night that I found that Trump had won the election. Ended up in Austin, gave a talk, went into Louisiana, crossed the mighty Mississippi River, places I'd never been before, into the great state of Alabama, into Florida. I found, I encountered this guy. I think this guy was a man named Mark Baumer. I don't know for a fact. He was a person that was walking across the United States barefoot to raise awareness for climate change. Uh, uh, if that is him, unfortunately, he was killed in a, a, a car accident just a couple days later. Into Places I'd only dreamed about. I'd never, never seen anything like this before until I got there. And the Florida Keys, this miles and miles of endless causeways. So the next thing on the telescope, what we're going to do is we need to tease out the field-dependent errors. Long story short, it's possible to have the telescope perfectly lined at one field point by, you can imagine, you put the secondary in the wrong place, and then it creates a wavefront error that you exactly cancel with the primary. You do that so you can have a perfect image at a single field point, but if you move away from that, you get bigger errors. Well, this has a very, very large science field, so it has to be aligned for the entire uh, process. So we came up with a technique to do this, to tease out these errors early on. And what we do is we move the spots into this little tight array like this, use the one down in the lower right-hand corner to guide with the guider, and then we move it around the science field within one instrument, the NIRCAM A, and then you can, by looking at the way the centroids move, you can work out the focus and the astigmatism turns. And it turns out there's a single equation that makes it possible to write down what the field dependence will be as a function of the secondary mirror positioning errors. Neat, huh? This equation, by the way, makes it possible to align the telescope. I don't know what we would have done. Uh, it's a simple, simple solution. Everything's simple when you know the answer. It took us years to figure this out. So in any case, the first thing we did was after making those piston corrections, we moved the telescope, we moved these things into this array. It's getting them as close to each other as we can without interfering with each other. And this will allow us to do Hartman techniques to tease out the low order wavefront errors. We went around and then measured at five different fuel points and we're looking at the change in those terms as a function of fuel position. Now it turns out that errors within the science camera themselves um, would dominate things like plate scale differences, pupil distortion, any effect you do to the misalignment of the telescope. So if you take those measurements and you invert this array and actually take it again in an upside down and backwards configuration and then average those two results, they, all the contributions due to the science instrument will cancel. So that's what we did. And so at the end of the day, when we ended up figuring all this out, we found out that there were some pretty significant errors in the secondary mirror. It needed to be translated even more in the, the direction that it had to be moved before, and we needed to tilt it all, more than half a milliradian in uh, one axis. And we kind of really gritted our teeth and did it, but uh, as it turns out, this is exactly the right thing uh, because we repeated this process again and those numbers down there ended up just being noise. Sigh of relief. Everybody has their moments on this project when we're finally th so thankful that it worked and this was mine because I really wasn't 100% certain that this idea was going to work until we got to the real telescope. So then once we corrected those field dependent errors by moving the secondary and adjusting the primary, then we needed to go back into global alignment again, where we're gonna move the secondary to, to finally tease out these, uh, you know, whatever's left in the um, individual, 
Okay. Well, we're going to just go with this. So anyway, we measured the, the wave fronts again. I had a little animation that shows them moving into that array. And we noticed there were just some little radius of curvature errors, maybe a little bit of translation of the segments. And um, took another set of images. And finally, at the end, we got it down to 44 nanometers RMS. There's some very, very small piston errors remaining. But other than that, this is just perfect. OK, I got to go back. I got to show this one. Uh, OK, here you are. Um, this is a comparison of that result with respect to the ground measurements. And you can see the difference between those two isn't worth mentioning. Um, in the, like the 11 o'clock position, you'll see a little dot in the GA2 result that is not in the ground measurements. That's one of the first known micrometeor hits. But you also see the scale that those things create. They're, they're comparable to aberrations that are already in the segments. Um, yes, yeah, so anyway, uh, the interesting thing pointing out is that it never actually really was measured on the ground because that was all indirect. You have to back out gravity sags and everything. So it, it's amazing that it really worked. Um, what we need to do now is to tilt all these mirror segments so that they align on the crosshairs. And as you can see, what happened is it didn't work. <laughs> we missed it, but that's no problem. We can just move them to be in the, in the right place. And at this point, now we're going to stack the images again, except this time we can use phase retrieval. And here we go. We step through all the, the, use the weak lenses in the science instrument and do phase retrieval on it. And all we're controlling is tip and tilt at this point. And as you can see, here is the, um, the, the, the focused image prior to applying these big piston corrections and afterwards. And you can see the coherence. Now we're well within the coherence length of the light on the right. Whereas before, we were out of the coherence link. This is why we can use phase retrieval now. So here's some more uh, coarse phasing images we took. Um, so we finally made, measured the, the coarse phasing errors one more time. And I scrunched them together like this so you could see the barber pole pattern. This is a result of intentionally adding three microns on, into the piston errors so that we have something to measure. OK. So I think let's see if, all right. And then finally, we did this fine phasing one more time. And uh, this time, we're controlling tip and tilt and the piston values. And by doing this, at the very last thing, we can see we are now completely phased. Uh, the telescope is, um, is now completely aligned. And let's see, if I push this, what happens? OK. And there we see we ended up with 46 nanometers RMS. All right. And this is the very first image we took. This is the first phased image taken with the telescope. We set it up such that everybody could be in the room at the same time. So basically, we, we didn't want anybody to see the, the first image until everybody got to see the first image. So we had everybody in this big conference room, and the data went through a pipeline. And, um, and then here it is, and it appeared. And uh, we intentionally saturated this star in there, as you can see the little dark thing, so that we could see the galaxies. And this is what a big surprise to me, just the galaxies that were everywhere. Okay, and on the next slide, you can see there were 241 galaxies in that very first image. On the next slide, this galaxy has, uh, has a supernova taking place in it even. You know, you take your first image and it's got a supernova. Now, how do you celebrate that effect? James Webb was born in 1906. It's, uh, you know, that was the, James Webb is the guy the telescope is named after, uh, really was a remarkable administrator of NASA. We would never have made it to the moon if it weren't for him. Um, next slide. But this bottle of cognac was also uh, born in 1906, and I was happy to say that uh, a guy who works on the project and myself were the proud owners of said bottle. Uh, next slide. And Matt Mountain, the director of Aura, got us some special glasses. Uh, next slide. And uh, we toasted James Webb and the telescope that bore his name with a 1906 cognac. And it was great. I, I don't drink, um, but I made an exception in this point, And I made uh, several exceptions at this point. And I got quite tipsy, uh, very, very tipsy, which is a grown-up way of saying drunk. And uh, I got back to my apartment. And I tweeted a friend. I said, I wish you could see the universe from my perspective. We are surrounded by a symphony of creation. There are galaxies everywhere. And later, uh, NASA you know, asked me for a quote, and, and I thought, well, what am I supposed to say? Then I remembered that tweet, copy, paste, click, send, it went viral. 
it was, uh, it was like in Forbes magazine, and it expresses a true sentiment that I was feeling at the time, but what most people don't realize is I said it because I was toasted on pre-prohibition alcohol. Um, in any case, uh, here we are. Okay, next slide. And then next slide. As you can see now, we got full phasing, and this, this makes a very, very crisp image. Let's go to the, okay. So on to New Zealand. Beautiful, beautiful country, beautiful people. Lovely. I mean, it's just, just, it's just amazing. Unbelievably friendly people in New Zealand. I went uh, up in the mountains once on a, on a track, and here was, uh, I ran into two people. I was single track, like a mountain bike trail, and I had a Ford to Creek at one point, and I ran into two people from New Zealand. They were up there and, as well, and they looked at me in this strange look in their face, and they said, you must be Dr. Acton. What? <laughs> Well, I did a radio interview earlier that, that week, and everyone in the country heard it. Uh, it was just, it was something. Wonderful country, such a diverse landscape. There's a Dunedin, uh, Baldwin Street in Dunedin, the steepest street in the world. Uh, I, 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 I had to go up that. You know, how could you not? And I woke up one morning in, in New Zealand, and this was on the front page of the local paper. <laughs> what a great place. All right, let's see. And then finally, we, uh, we moved around a little bit to, to tease out, to make sure there aren't any uh, field-dependent errors, and we do this simply by defocusing with the secondary mirror a little bit, and then taking images at multiple field points in each science instrument. But you know what? There really wasn't anything there. This is a hard problem to, to deal with because, sure, on NearCam, we could put a narrowband filter, and you know, it makes the math quite simpler when it comes to doing convolution and deconvolution and all that. But, these other instruments are undersampled and they're broadband in nature, but it's doable, it's just hard. And uh, we ended up getting all these phase maps and we, I also had results for the, in, for the spec, spectrograph, but we didn't include those in this chart. But come to find out, there really was no corrections to be made. It was good enough, just a slight focus balancing and that's it. And we were done. Everybody was happy. But we did one more test, thermal stability measurements. Now this is an interesting test. Um, the idea was we wanted to point the telescope at a star and leave it there for like five days and just watch how the wavefront evolved over time and then turn it to a completely different orientation that has different thermal load on the telescope and see how the wavefront evolved. It turns out it was quite stable during that test. But somebody had this idea, so sure, your telescope is stable, but how do you know that the whole spacecraft isn't rolling through this? Because you're, you're guiding on this star. It guarantees your pointing is right, but how do you know that you're not rolling this... The observatory is a reasonable question. So he said, oh, well, I um, will tell you what, we'll use the primary guider to guide the telescope, but we'll use the redundant one to uh, take like a 20 minute integration, to so take a 20 minute image and just see, and if it's rolling, you could see it by smearing of the stars, right? Makes sense. And so it turns out, if you think about it, you got a six and a half meter telescope that's cooled to like 40 Kelvin and you're at L2, there's no light, and you got a science instrument that's not really a science instrument, but it's, it's, it's open, it's, it's sensitive to from one to five microns, and you take a 20 minute integration. You're gonna see a lot of depth, but imagine what happens if you take a hundred of those and add them together. And that's what we ended up with this image. This was by far the deepest image ever taken, much deeper than the Hubble Ultra Deep Field, and it was completely accidental. <laughs> You know, you just pick any, I sent this to an astronomer at UCLA, and he estimated that there were 15,000 galaxies in this single image. There is no dark sky. If you just pick a spot in this, let's see if I can get to that. Okay, next slide, please. Next slide. You zoom in on it. Everything you see there that's, that's above the noise, that's a galaxy. Unbelievable. All right, next chart. All right, you know, that is... The last slide here, um, credit where credit is due. This was very much a badgeless team. And uh, I want to thank everybody for your attention. Thank you so much. All right. So should I go sit down now? Or? Yeah, yeah, you can go down. So uh, thank you so much, Scott. What a lot of fun. I had a blast with that talk. Um, I just want to let everybody know, some of you might have questions on the tip of your tongue. You will have an opportunity to ask questions immediately after this session. 
Um, you're welcome to remain. We're going to have uh, about a 30-minute Q&A time or up to 30-minute Q&A time with Scott. Uh, but we just need a minute or two to reset the stage. Uh, so while they're doing that, just want to mention a couple quick things. Uh, today and tomorrow, I want to invite you uh, to come to the Science and Industry Showcase to meet exhibiting companies here behind you. Uh, there's going to be coffee breaks, networking events, career events, technology demonstrations. There's going to be a number of sessions taking place here in what we call the theater area. Uh, so again, I want to thank you for attending today's plenary session. And in just a minute, we're going to begin the Q&A session. Uh, there's going to be some microphones. You see them here in the aisles. So we do ask uh, that if you, if you would like to ask Scott a question, uh, we do ask that you use the microphone so that everybody can hear you. Um, and other than that, uh, following the Q&A session, I want to just invite everybody to have a wonderful day at, at FIO and Laser Science, and I look forward to seeing you up here in the, in the exhibit area. So I think TC is going to ask you a question first. OK. You cut your hair since the bike trip. What's that? You cut your hair since the bike trip. Does oh, yeah. 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 <laughs> uh, a few times. Yeah, I got a haircut right before I left. Oh, OK. Because yeah. you either get a haircut or a pair of new shoes, and I chose the haircut. <laughs> Yeah, go ahead, Are we ready? Okay. Well, uh, first of all, thank you for uh, attending the Q&A sessions there. First of all here, I would like to thank uh, Scott again for the enlightening talk there. So what I'm going to do, I'll kick off with the first questions, okay? <laughs> and now, Scott, uh, we know that the Hubble has been, what, the, we all heard about Hubble because it has been uh, in the sky for like uh, 30 years, and now, uh, the Jim Webbs uh, has just been commissioned for less than a year. Uh, could you tell us the difference between the two telescopes? Yeah, there's a, you know, obviously the, the Webb telescope is uh, quite a bit bigger. Um, and it primarily, though, looks in the infrared, uh, whereas Hubble was primarily in the visible. Um, you know, James Webb is in a, uh, the second Lagrangian point, and Hubble is in a low Earth orbit. Um, but the, the main difference is what you can see in the infrared light. As you know, uh, the universe is expanding, and anything that's a long ways away is moving away from us at a you know, very, you know, very high speed. In fact, what sets the visible universe is uh, you know, eventually things moving away from us are moving faster than the speed of light, so you can never see them. Uh, but So if you really want to see anything about the early universe, you have to look in the infrared, because that's where all the... All the, in, all the interesting stuff is. Further, if you want to look into, uh, like, get the visible light will be blocked by, uh, you know, nebula, by, by inter, interstellar dust. So if you want to look inside of a place, a region where stars are forming, you generally have to use uh, infrared light because the visible is blocked by that, but infrared is, gets around it somehow. I see. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you. Switching on, on it. So, thank you for an amazing talk and such amazing, uh, you know, only one year in or so, and we're still seeing some uh, yeah. amazing images every day. Um, my question is, what do you think the longevity is going to be of the James Webb Space Telescope? And could you tell us a bit about what could affect that? You mentioned a micrometeorite yeah. earlier, for example. So, there are things, mm -hmm. other things that you can expect, and can you repair them? Um, well, I th the, right now, the prediction is 20 years. Um, and 
you know, that it, it seems like it shouldn't last that long. I mean, that's just sort of the way it feels, but I couldn't tell you why it won't. I, th I think it might just do that. The things you worry about, obviously, are detectors aging. Um, you know, they do have a, a shelf life and all the cosmic radiation, background radiation hitting them. You know, who knows? Uh, you may begin to see some, you know, 15 years or so in, you might begin to see some loss of uh, sensitivity. Um, uh, obviously, if you run out of fuel, um, that's really what sets the lifetime of the thing. You know, the, the, the L2 is a semi-stable orbit, but it has to be touched up every now and then. And uh, when you run out of fuel, uh, the spacecraft slowly drifts away and you never see it again. So, or maybe, uh, maybe SpaceX will go retrieve it for us or something. Who knows what will happen in 20 years. Um, and then, yes, you mentioned the micrometeors. Uh, at this point, every, all the data I have uh, indicates that that will not be what limits the, the life of the telescope. Um, you never know, though. We were caught off guard on, in mid-May by this uh, a, a very uh, strong strike on one of the mirror segments. And our, hoping, our hope is that that's the rare occurrence. You know, as it was, um, it did not degrade the science capability of the telescope. Um, you get a dozen of those, and that's going to be a different story. So, uh, I, you know, right now, so it's May, June, July, August. It's been like four or five months in. So I think they are, those are rare. Uh, small ones happen about every two, three weeks. Um, but they, you know, they just make a little tiny dent. You, you have to really look hard to see it. Um, so I think we're okay. Yeah, 20 years, that's what I'm going with. <laughs> Great, thanks. Um, hello, thank you very much for your talk. It was very interesting. You're welcome. Um, my question is regarding the time scales that it took to align the telescope, and I was particularly curious of, so sort of how long does it take to send an instruction and how long does it take to figure out what that instruction did and how it affected the telescope? Well, in commissioning, we kind of dominated the deep space network. We had 24-7 coverage, and eh, I would say the quickest you could ever uh, create a, you know, a, a, a command, we call it a, you know, a, a wafer control file or something, and have it executed and getting it back down looking at the images was about four or five hours. Um, in practice, you know, things get in the way, you know, it can take a while. Uh, you, know, you don't always get your data, you know, when you, when you want it, uh, that kind of thing. But yeah, the fastest it ever is is four or five hours. We kind of planned on like a shift, maybe eight hours would be the nominal. Sure. Mm -hmm. uh, a question about cost and schedule. These large programs, whether it's Hubble or Chandra or James Webb, always seem to take more time and cost more money than they were originally estimated at. And I just wondered if you could comment as your role in a program manager as to what lessons may have been learned about estimation of both cost and time in doing large programs like this? Because I, I know they're very difficult to estimate. There's new technology, um, but you must have learned some lessons. Well, I, I, I've always thought, because I had a background in the aerospace industry before on this project, and uh, was that you figured a factor of two and a half or three, you know, based on what was bid and what they ended up just costing. So I was fully expecting a factor of three, and, but, uh, you know, not a factor of 10. And, you know, so it's hard to say. I'm probably the wrong person to answer that question. Um, I just think this is what these telescope cost. And I think we know that now, and we didn't know it then. Um, there wasn't really any mismanagement or anything like that. It was just, this is just what it takes. It really does. You know, you, you could certainly have attempted this project for quite a lot of less money. I don't think you could have got it to work, though. <laughs> uh, these, most of this technology didn't exist uh, when we started and had to be invented and brought to a TRL, well now it's all TRL 9, but uh, so yeah, I, I, uh, if I were to, if I could just sideways a little bit from your question, um, uh, one of the things that worked really well that I learned from this is this concept of a badgeless team. You know, we had uh, multiple organizations uh, that were, that had to work together and somehow very early on we just completely erase the institutional lines between the players. People from different countries, people from different institutions, and somebody might say, no, we don't want to do it this way, let's do it this way, even though they didn't have any contractual responsibility for that thing, uh, we listened to them. 
And uh, I, I think that's the way to run a project. Um, you know, that's, that's one of the lessons I learned. That... Thank, thank, thank you so much for the uh, excellent talk and the uh, work. Uh, I have a question about the, um, the scalability and size, weight, and power. So these things are very heavy and you know, uh, payload is heavy. To send satellites. So then, have you looked into something like uh, interferometric imaging with the photo integrated circuit array to create something that does the same or maybe better resolution with a uh, hundred times lower uh, size, weight, and power? That's one direction. Another thing is about the uh, these high level, high uh, resolution images take quite a bit of um, uh, time to transmit. So then, have you looked into something like uh, hyperspectral imaging? with the um, well, comprehensive hyperspectral imaging that can also reduce the amount of data to be transmitted. You measure compressed first, send out the compressed data, and then the ground station can expand that. Oh, interesting. Um, I guess the quick answer is uh, probably. Uh, I know a lot of people have looked into this. Even for this project, we considered interferometric imaging. And I don't really know why that never really got a lot of traction. I think it's a uh, you know, I showed this uh, phase retrieval chart early on. Well, the father of phase retrieval, uh, Dr. Robert Gonzalez, has an expression that, uh, that has always stuck with me, and that is, if you want a good picture, you take a good picture. And I think there is a natural tendency to shy away from any kind of imaging that requires deconvolution or whatever. Um, so I don't know. I, I think uh, scalability. Um, I'm not sure what will ultimately lim limit the size of an aperture you can put in space. Probably micrometeors, uh, if I had to guess right now. Um, but uh, yeah, I don't think putting a big telescope in space is going to be a problem in the coming years. Uh, I think we're kind of at the limit of what you can put in one launch, perhaps. Uh, but you could put multiple launches and assemble it. Um, yeah, I hope that answers your question. Uh, but uh, I, I'm afraid. Uh, yeah, that, I, I, don't, I, I don't see us doing very much for in interferometric imaging unless it's a specific mission, you know, where we want to uh, look at maybe a, a, a planet at a star, you know, around a star. And uh, I, I personally, I, I could be completely wrong. I don't see that being a, a direction we will go for a generic uh, astronomical tool. Does that make sense? Yeah, I, I think so. The, uh, I, I just happen to be working on three NASA projects, and NASA people have been telling us that the payload and scale of route has been a big concern. Mm -hmm. So we've been looking at this um, interferometric imaging and array that does the imaging in the Fourier domain instead of real space, and you can do all this phase correction in the Fourier domain. And then compressive imaging allows you to do, say, you know, thousand different color with um, n by n pixels hmm. with a, maybe two n square instead of n cube type yeah. of, so that by scalability. But well, we that's, a, that. that's very interesting. You know, right now we're not really limited by the bandwidth, the data rates uh, from the telescope. Uh, that's, I don't think that's the bottleneck, uh, but it sure could be if you had a, 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 you know, a bigger field of view or a bigger imager, yeah. But I would encourage you to take a look what's happening right now, even today in Boca Chica, Texas. Uh, the, the launch vehicle that, uh, that SpaceX is developing, I, I predict, is going to get close to $10 a kilogram in a low Earth orbit. Um, I, th I think we're, you know, the, I, I, I have no trouble just envisioning any very large telescope being in space in the future. But it's the future. Who knows? Uh, it would be nice to have 100 times lower size, weight, and power for the same capability. Right? So, okay. okay. Thank you. Hi, Dr. Acton. Uh, I really appreciate your uh, talk today. It was You're really, uh, really awesome to actually see that. Um, but uh, my question was mainly about you mentioned that you had uh, kind of you lost the walls on the, between institutions and things like that. Yeah. And uh, when it comes to working with different teams, sometimes you know if all you have a hammer, everything looks like a nail. How do you kind of make that decision on what uh, you know approach to use when you have all these different opinions? Um, and how do you kind of make those final decisions? Uh, is it usually pretty obvious, or is it a lot of deliberation and thinking about it really hard, or uh, what's your approach usually? Well, I suppose ultimately it comes down to uh, somebody having the authority. Uh, but, uh, but by and large, it was just very 
uh, very collaborative, very uh, cooperating. Um, you know, uh, I think once once you feel secure and confident with each other, you know, if, if there's somebody you don't know, right, you're very, very skeptical. But once you become friends, maybe you got to drink together a little bit or something, uh, you, you know that the individual's not trying to, you know, take your, your job away from you. And, um, you know, my attitude is I want all the help I can get, you know. Mm -hmm. If you got an idea that's, I mean, why, why, would I, why would I reject that just because it wasn't my idea, you know. Mm -hmm. And there are a lot of really, really, uh, good things came out of the people that, that didn't have the contractual responsibility for aligning the telescope. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you. Sure, yeah. So Scott, a question about your bicycle trip. Okay. On your trip, what country or group of people did you find the most receptive to the science that you were talking about? Besides the, you know, other uh, things that you said, friendly people, but you know, yeah. Who, who are the best in, in receiving the science? Well, I, I have to be, you know, obviously when I went to um, scientific institutions and gave talks there. Uh, so I would say uh, Germany, Austria, um, Switzerland. Uh, you know, if you just stop by a local community, there is a, a lot of interest. Uh, but by and large, the, it, you know, various colleges and schools and everything, the people had never heard of James Webb Space Telescope. Um, and uh, the places, the inst research institutes did, obviously. Um, but I'll, I'll answer a question you didn't ask, and I would say the prettiest place to bicycle. All right, so is uh, Passau, Germany to Bratislava, Slovakia. It is just, just a slice of heaven. If you're gonna take a bike ride, do that one. You can rent electric bikes and, and, and do that part of the trip. But yeah, definitely, definitely those countries, so. <laughs> Thank you for the really inspiring talk. Um, You're welcome. Uh, well, three questions. Uh, the first one, you mentioned the universe is expanding, so you want to really look out. The shift is from visible to the infrared. Um, what do you think of the future going towards this gap with the mid-infrared, the terahertz, uh, looking into it from a spectroscopic point of view, and I guess? I don't know about the future. I mean, you have to, right? Yeah. If, if, I'm not sure where we're seeing right now, maybe, you know, 200 million years after the Big Bang or whatever, um, but there's stuff there. There's still that last little gap, so if you don't look in longer wavelengths with higher sensitivity and greater depth, you won't see it. So um, I, I don't really, I mean, you know, who knows where the, the, the attitudes will go right now. I think there's a lot more um, interest in pursuing uh, exosolar planets, uh, you know, getting spectra from planets, coronography and all that, than there is of, of getting to the last little bit of uh, what we can see in our own universe. Um, but, you know, after seeing this data, I'm, I'm actually very intrigued by it. Um, I'm not an astronomer, uh, but I can sure look at pictures and say, gee, there's a lot of galaxies there, and they sort of look like galaxies do today, even though they're only, you know, they're, we're only 200 million years after the universe began. And some of them have neon and oxygen in them. How is that? Because you, in order to get those elements, you have to have a mature galaxy. So how on earth do you get galaxies that are only 200 million years after the universe began and that, have, that are mature? You know, so I think uh, there's quite a mystery there. Um, we clearly don't have a perfect understanding of galactic formation at the very least. And, and maybe there's something even fundamental. And maybe the universe is older than we think it is. I, I, who knows? Um, but so, so it could be that the, added, that the interest shifts towards that. But uh, right now I see it towards um, a, a comparable type telescope uh, designed to get extremely high contrast imaging of extrasolar planets. We'll see. Thanks. Thanks. Sure. Um, and the second is, well, for big design projects like this, uh, what's your decision making like? I mean, you, you mentioned some of the actuators and you can surely put the actuators in pretty much everything. So. Yeah. How do you parameterize things like this? How, how do you do what? How do you parameterize which are the you know things that you would want to optimize when it launches in the direction that you would want to optimize? I'm yeah. sure you could optimize the Zernike polynomials to the nth degree you would want to, but when do you stop? And how does that factor into your decision making? Okay, now I, I want to make sure I understand your question. You're asking us how we optimize the wavefront? 
or you asked me the uh, question about program management. Yeah, uh, so it's more about program management. Okay, so how, well, okay, so well, early on in the project, it, a couple of little tricks that are really good, and I've even played this like with my children in trying to figure out their career plans and everything, is you can put forth something known as a point solution. So uh, a project that is too big to keep inside of any one person's head. Uh, you, what, you, it's very possible that you can do your own thing and they can do their own thing and then you get to the end and they're completely incompatible. So what you do is you have something, a point solution. You say, just fast forward, just skip over a lot of steps and tell me what you think your final thing is going to look like. And then we'll do the same. And then you can very early come up with uh, um, you know, potential conflicts and potential um, uh, issues. And, and this was done a couple of times early on in the project. So we identified a handful of technology areas that we knew were going to be difficult to work on. Uh, wafer and sensing control was just one of them. Uh, but so these got a lot of effort and had to be, uh, you know, they were given a lot of funding, a lot of, um, uh, you know, a lot of experimentation, development, and they had to be brought to a, a technology readiness level of six uh, prior to allowing us to go forward with the final critical design of the, of the telescope. And so I think the, the, that's the answer is you've got to play some games to know what is going to be hard. Um, for our standpoint, it was the interplay between uh, modeling and simulations and experimentation which led us to know within our own subsystem what was going to be difficult. Uh, so we built, uh, I didn't show a picture of it, but we built a, a one-six scale uh, model of the telescope with flight-like actuators, everything. And we realized that the, the, the difficulty was going to be this field-dependent issue and uh, the measuring the piston errors, you know, and that's what we had to concentrate on. And with regards to the actuator, we, just, we realized that the, the interplay between the coarse and the fine mechanisms uh, had to, you know, th that was the hardest part about them. It was all about preserving and conserving the fine range. Um, in any case, I hope that answers your question, because that's kind of all I got. I mean, on, a, on, a, um, on a fun generation uh, of iterations point of view, so when you're trying to launch a product, you go through Gen 4, Gen 5, and that typically is the average for a lot of products. Uh -huh. What is it like for the individual pieces that you are trying to work with? Hmm. Well, we had, you know, we really, yeah, it wasn't like that, really. Okay. We had prototypes, and we had, uh, you know, research projects, and then finally, you know, the, like for the actuators, there wasn't anything like it, you okay. know. It, um, it didn't exist until it was built, and yeah, that was a real innovative thing. There were probably uh, two or three uh, prototype designs before we final, settled on the final one, you know. Um, well, and, well, finally, because you said, uh, I wish we saw the world from the perspective you yes. saw, and you've seen, uh, you've been in that perspective, and you've also seen this planet from biking around places. Yeah. So, what are your views in general on the future of sort of scientific space expedition versus space tourism? Well, I don't know. I think it's, uh, uh, you know, I. I uh, I started working on this project. I made a decision in 2001 that I would do this. And okay. prior to that, I really wanted to, um, I thought getting people to Mars would be a really good thing right. to spend your life on. To, if I'm going to take a couple decades and do something that matters, uh, I thought that would be. But I looked around the world and concluded, as did pretty much everybody else, that the window of opportunity for humanity to become a spacefaring civilization had closed. And it had, sociologically, economically, uh, um, you know, politically, there was just no will. And somehow, uh, Elon Musk has opened this. Uh, he has, uh, he's already done the hardest part. And that is, in the brain of every little kid, he owns a tiny part of their brain that says, we will be a spacefaring civilization. It will happen. And I've seen this all over the place, so I have uh, actually quite a lot of optimism in that regard. I, I think that, 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 you know, it's certainly not going to be, you know, something that I get to live to see uh, fulfilled, but I really think it will be a commonplace uh, for most of us, you know, be like taking an airplane flight. You know, you will, oh yeah, I'm going to go into space, yeah, just a spring break, you know, that kind of thing. <laughs> and, <laughs> uh, thank you so much for your insights. You're welcome. Yeah, and appreciate the, uh, the entertaining talk. You have pushed the boundaries of technology. You've demonstrated that in space. 
how do you see some of the techniques that you've developed impacting, enhancing terrestrial instruments? Hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, the phase retrieval techniques are pretty general. Um, if you want to make an end-to-end -end wavefront measurement in any kind of instrument, that's, that's pretty good. Um, so terrestrial instruments for like in ground-based astronomy? Or... Uh, I'll let you look up or I'll let you look horizontal. Horizontal, huh? Yeah, well, um, yeah, I, I think that's the main thing. Um, the, the technologies for, for horizontal looking, um, uh, prior to this project, I w would have said it was impossible to make a mirror that's one meter in diameter that has, you know, 30 nanometers RMS. Um, and that was done routinely on this project. So I think uh, that has all kinds of implications, um, you know, for, you know for, for certain kind of applications. Um, you so know, so I'll, I'll, I'll plant a little seed. So it took, I heard you say, you know, five hours at best. You, mm -hmm. you uh, put in eight hours. So if you had a higher, a quicker adaptability, mm -hmm. if you could send something out, measure it, and change, what, what could oh, you do with that? Well, now keep in mind the five hours is, is, the, is paperwork, <laughs> right? That's, that's really not a technical limitation. Oh. Okay. Yeah, it's, uh, it's making sure everybody signs off and agrees on it. It's just built into the system so that you don't inadvertently, you know, screw something up. Uh, it's done very, very slow and deliberate. As far as, you know, generating the commands and getting an image back, that's kind of, you know, minutes, you know, it, if you really, really did it that way. And if you, um, could, if you could push it down to seconds or milliseconds, what more could you do? Well, um, I don't know. It, it's a, it is, um, I suppose if, if, if you had real-time control, uh, you don't have to put all your decision capability on the spacecraft. If you could get it down to seconds, you could have a, a, a really smart neural network or something on the ground uh, controlling the optics. Uh, if you're in an environment where you need to do that, um, you know, what, what are we, what are we shooting? What, you tell me the answer. Uh, I think, okay. <laughs> I think one of the science advisors from Optica. <laughs> okay. Thank you very much. Uh, you bet. <laughs> so, so let me just riff off that a little bit. So what if you had an array of telescopes disconnected up in space? Could you phase them? Is that even possible? Do you have to develop new technology? How would you do that? Um, you mean phase them optically? So they, they come together and you get an image? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah you could do that. Yeah, you know, magnetic thrusters, uh, you know, the, I think the technology is there. Yep. Is that a good way to go? Um, I, probably not. I, I think that uh, you would much rather, I mean, unless it's uh, close to, you know, like a giant Magellan telescope, you know, where they have seven mirrors, but yeah, they may as well be one mirror, right? Um, that, that's just my, my prejudice that I think interferometry, you know, when you're making images like that, sparse apertures and all that, is when it, it, not radio now, but in the opti optical world, is, is kind of a solution looking for a problem. Uh, if you can make a filled aperture telescope, I mean, why wouldn't you just make a filled aperture telescope, you know? Well, one other application would be, of course, terrestrial. And so you have, you know, planet-sized aperture, and you can use, uh -huh. like they've done for the black hole research. So. Um, and I know there are issues there, but is your technology that you all develop for the web um, anything that needs to be applied to that, or is that simply a timing issue? I see, yeah, I mean, I, I suppose the difference I'm learning maybe just, just today is that, you know, you gotta keep in mind, web was designed to be a, a very versatile, generic thing. If you, are, you have a particular mission where all you care about is just that, that really super high resolution of certain phenomena, uh, an interferometer might be the way to go, you know. Um, the first stellar diameters were measured with interferometers. Um, you know, and if, that's what, if that's what you're after, yeah, I, would think, I think you're right. Maybe, maybe so. It's, it's really hard. <laughs> uh, so, I thank you for your uh, quite interesting talk. You're welcome. So, my question is, that, uh, what, what was the biggest uh, unexpected after launch about uh, aligning and phasing a mirror and how, how did you deal with it? 
The biggest unexpected things, huh? Um, well, I, 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 there were, uh, I, I understand with any space mission, there's always things that, you know, kind of make you, uh, make you very nervous. Um, the, uh, I, the, the, probably, uh, though, from a wavefront sensing and controls perspective, um, the, the difficulty in the beginning of not being able to control the pointing of the telescope uh, was required us to do literally just invent stuff on the fly. You know, I didn't talk about it much, but it was, um, you know, we, all the software was designed to rely on the, the, the fact that after calibration, we should be able to point the telescope to within two arc seconds. And it was more like two arc minutes. So, um, so that required a lot of innovation, um, you know, thinking, shooting from the hip, so to speak, uh, you know, dealing with those pointing uncertainties. Um, there were, you know, uh, the couple issues with the mirror segments that, uh, that, that were very worrisome. Uh, like I say, from February 2nd until Super Bowl Saturday, I don't know when that was, uh, uh, we thought we had really, really screwed up two of those mirrors. And we were trying to figure out um, if we would still be able to meet our science objectives or not. And uh, that was just failure to understand and on our part. You know, it was just completely, it was, there was nothing wrong with them all along. Um, so that was, uh, you know, rather nervous. We thought that, you know, you saw that picture as it's moving away from the Earth, that perhaps the sun shining on those two segments, because those are the two lower segments. The wings, you know, as they built, built, left those other two segments kind of exposed, we thought that they maybe got so hot that the, the glue had melted and uh, yielded the figure. But in fact, that wasn't the case. Did that answer your question? Yeah. Okay, yeah. Thanks, Otto. Certainly. Uh, oh, hello, Scott. Oops. Hey. <laughs> <laughs> uh, hello? Okay. Yeah, that's good. I can hear you. Excellent. Um, uh, great talk. I think it was wonderful to see the success that you guys had on the James Webb Telescope. I think for a young scientist, perhaps it's more inspiring to see the successes that everyone has in developing the technology for this device. I was wondering if there was any sort of failure or initial design parameters that were not met. And in that case, what is the decision making that goes behind perhaps delaying the project to try and get that or perhaps just abandoning it and replacing it with something else? Well, you know, we saw, uh, if I understand your question correctly, we saw that uh, quite a bit, not in the wavefront sensing and controls, but on the project in general. And at each time, the decision was made, you know, correctly to, um, to, to delay the project until it was fixed. Um, and that's why it took so long, part of the reason it took so long to get it into space. Um, I don't know if I can think, I, I think of, uh, so you're asking for what, uh, what did we, um, like, Compromise on. I guess I was just yeah. asking if there was any sort of uh, obstacle that was uh, not achieved. Yeah, well, I think, okay, in the instrumentation, for example, um, you know, we talked about the near-infrared uh, imager and slitless spectrograph. That used to be called the TFI, the Tunable Filter Instrument. And uh, the Canadian team had this, brilliant idea to make this completely universally tunable uh, filter to any wavelength by just changing a voltage on a set of plates. Um, and uh, they could not get that to survive, survive the vibe test. Uh, so in the end, so they basically had to completely abandon that and end up with this, the imager that, that's there now. Um, we we've, we've forgot about it, that it used to be called the tunable filter. Um, <laughs> But that, that was their approach. I can't, think, can't remember if there were any more like that. Um, there certainly were a lot of D-scopes made, but not really so much because of uh, not panning out technologically, but because of mass considerations. You know, we talked about having a docking ring adapter, uh, you know, for future servicing, and that was, you know, anything you put on that spacecraft that would add mass means less fuel, you know, because, you know, so uh, there's a lot of things, you know, there were no, web cameras or anything to see, watch the deployment, you know, to see where things were, that would have been kind of nice, but, uh, you know, that's all I can think of, really, of things that just flat out didn't work that we had to get rid of and, and start over on. Okay, 
Sure. Okay. Thank you. I think we have time for maybe one or two more, so maybe the two of you, please. At the time of your world tour on the bike, what uh, had the instrument been launched at that point? Or? No, no. Uh -uh. It, it was uh, still uh, being put together in, at Goddard Space Flight Center. So I would imagine this talk that you're giving today looking backwards is completely different than the one that you're looking forward and you're trying to project a sense of optimism to these oh, people yeah. you're talking to. How did that go down? Yeah, no, it was very, very different. Um, I, I gave roughly 100 presentations in my bike ride, you know, or <laughs> maybe, maybe not that many, but a lot. And there was no science data. <laughs> it was all completely speculative. So I talked more about the observatory itself in a general sense as opposed to, you know, the wavefront sensing and controls was like two charts. Um, you know, there's a lot of really cool stuff uh, that you can talk about for the, all the subsystems on the spacecraft, you know, the, the sun shield, the, the, how they make the back plane of that. It's made out of a, a graphite, you know, a composite structure. It's a, that happens to be the same material that's in the, the, um, the, you know, in certain sports cars and stuff, you know. So there's a lot of really neat stuff to change, to, to appeal to a, a, a less optical in, uh, audience, and um, and that's the way I slanted it. Um, you know, I mean, I'm really, I gotta tell you, I'm really glad it worked. <laughs> this would be a very different talk if it didn't work. You know, when... Um, the lessons learned talk. Yeah, when uh, Neil, Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin were on the moon, you know, back in 1969, and they're jumping around and singing songs and seeing how high they could jump and all that, everybody just loved that. That was phenomenal. Everybody it just just touched the world, except for one guy, the lead engineer on those spacesuits. He was soiling himself because he just knew he just knew they were going to poke a hole in those spacesuits, and one of them was going to die, and it was going to be his fault. And so, um, you know, I, I guess it was Bruce Lee or somebody that said uh, that you know the failure is in not trying. That 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 the honor should be taken in trying, even if you fail, and that's very true. But all things considered, I'd rather be successful. <laughs> yeah, I, <laughs> and <laughs> I, it, it, it seems to me that there's a lot of value in, in talking about the, the, the story arc, the narrative that you went 20 years with this and you gave 100 talks in a situation where things were in doubt and murky looking forward. It's so easy to look backwards and assume that science just is, yeah, we built this, we flew it, and we we're taking these um, massive images that are amazing. Yeah. And uh, so to me, the story arc of, of for most of that time, there was doubt and uncertainty and unknown, unsolved problems. Yeah, so, I went personally, and I don't mind saying this at all. I, I like a couple weeks before the launch, uh, Bill Oakes, who is a program manager, went on 60 Minutes, and he gave an interview, and they asked him what the chances of success were, and he said, "I'm 100% certain that everything is going to work," and he was right. <laughs> uh, personally, I put it in the high 60s. I thought there was better than 50-50 chance that we'd have a successful mission, but I, 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 I was very doubtful. Wow. Uh, wow. Just too many chances to screw up, too many, too many things to fail. I uh, just science, go on and on. Right. I mean, that is, that is, that is science, yeah. is, is being standing there right in that moment of uncertainty. I, I worried about the non-explosive non actuators, these things that had to deploy after the launch, and you couldn't test them you couldn't, because they're a one-shot thing. You use it and then it's done. And in testing, we had multiple failures, you know, so they kind of worked on it, worked on it, worked on it, and finally got it to the 100%, so. Wow. Yep. Thanks so much. Yeah, sure. Our, our last question, please. Uh, hello. Um, I'm an undergraduate student who's interested in learning more about phase retrieval and computational imaging, and I was wondering, from your perspective, um, how much more there is left to explore in that front? Um, like, what kinds of problems are there still available to tackle um, for you guys as you were looking at the James Webb? What kind of future challenges do you foresee for that field? Do you feel as though you're in a place where you're comfortable with where the technology is at? Uh, I'm always curious because as an undergraduate, you're in a place where you can still decide where you would like to go, and what kind of challenges do you, do you foresee? Um, in that area. Yeah, no, absolutely. If you were, if, if, if you're saying you wanted to go, uh, you know, study um, phasing a six meter segmented telescope in this exact same environment, I would say, yeah, we pretty much got that one covered. But there's just all kinds of limiting con conditions and cases where uh, there's just no end to the amount of research that you could do in that area. Um, you know, maybe you don't have a star, a point like star. 
uh, just, just looking to see how the performance of the existing stuff degrades as a function of uh, various corrupting uh, you know, th uh, things. Um, uh, maybe you want to completely shift gears and do it as an earth imaging system. How do you make the wavefront measurements for an extended object? Um, Broadband spectra as opposed to narrow, undersampled, um, in the presence of vibration. Uh, or maybe you want to do it quickly, so you've got to come up with a way of optimizing this. You know, right now, I know that Giant Magellan Telescope, for example, is using phase retrieval, and they've got to get the thing running at 50 hertz. So they need to, you know, literally a 50th of a second. I, I have no idea how to do that. You know, my, my algorithms take minutes to converge. So there really is no, if, if that's something you have a heart for, the place to be is Goddard Space Flight Center. They've got a whole team. Um, I, I would strongly recommend you try to get an internship there. And uh, you come to the University of, Ro U University of Rochester? Yeah, I am at the University of Rochester. Oh, do you know Jim Feenup? Or? I am doing my thesis with him right now. Okay, yeah, well, he'll, he'll point you in the right place. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, well, you were just tricking me. You know the answer to this already. Yeah, there's all kinds of stuff to do. We, we left some. We left some for you to work on. Don't worry about it. <laughs> Sounds good. Thank you so much. All right. Sure, all right. I I think that's all the time we have for questions. Thank you, everybody, for, for staying around. And let's thank Scott one more time. Thank you.